My name is Stuart sarkozy Bonacy, and I'm with Resilient Cities Network and Precovery Labs, and I will be doing the MCing tonight, which basically means trying to keep us on track, um, not on the technical side, but uh, with the flow of the conversation. And we do have a lot of speakers tonight that are from the Resilience 21 Coalition. And so if everybody would stay on mute, keep their cameras on, um, really engage in the conversation, throw your questions into chat, um, we are going to uh, take you through a little bit of a background on Resilience 21 and how we got here and what that all means. But then the most exciting part of tonight is we're going to turn over to our set of speakers uh, and I will introduce them um, all at once when we begin that section. But uh, really, really happy to see so many people registered and joining us tonight for our real first public Resilience 21 um, event. And uh, it's been quite a it's been quite a few months. So um, great to have great to see everybody tonight. I'm going to uh, turn it over to my co-facilitator on Resilience 21, Lori Showman, who will uh, really open us up and, and get us all welcomed in. And then we'll go to um, Marissa after that. So welcome, everybody. And over to you, Lori. Thank you, Stuart, and it's a pleasure to see everyone, our entire community, coming together for this important evening. Um, <clears throat> I first want to say and thank um, Enterprise Community Partners for hosting us tonight. Uh, if we were in person, we would be in a facility uh, that would be uh, uh, run or owned by Enterprise, but tonight we're on a virtual room, so thank you uh, to my my organization, Enterprise Community Partners, um, national nonprofit working on affordable housing and opportunity for us all. So before we go into the technical housekeeping, I wanna just say, you know, we are a community of practitioners. We work together, we strive together, we fret together, we cry together, and we dream big. Um, this is our time, this is our week, to think big, to think out of the bounds, to think about what's possible and to do the work. Um, we are, building an equitable movement that's going to promote justice and equity and resilience for all of us. And we, and our time is now, and this is a special week. This is Earth Week, Oceans Week, Equity Week, Climate Week. Here we are together the night before tomorrow, which is another big day for our nation, where we'll hear a lot of great information and updates from our new president um, and our administration about what is to come. Um, so it is an honor for us to be here together. Thank you. Um, we will ask you to please use the chat rigorously because we really want to make sure that we have our virtual community dialoguing throughout. So please feel free to use the chat, ask questions, comment, edit. Um, this is this is the space we can use. Um, uh, we will be recording this and we will make sure to get this out to you afterwards. Um, I'm so honored to be here with Stuart and Marissa, our co-facilitators of Resiliency 21. I'd like to now uh, turn to Marissa Aho, Chief Resiliency Officer of Houston, to tell us about R21. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks, Lori. Good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Um, so excited to be able to tell you a little bit more about Resilience 21, if you're not familiar, uh, who we are, what we're about, and also plug resilience21.org. Um, so we are a coalition, like Lori said, of resilience practitioners from around the country representing diverse communities and a variety of resilience expertise. Um, and we were formed really organically at the end of the year last year and the beginning of this year um, with the tremendous opportunity to identify federal resilience recommendations from the past and from today and looking towards tomorrow um, and coalesce them and prioritize them um, and, and work with partners given the urgency that all of the sort of depth and breadth that resilience brings um, today, uh, uh, it, it's so, so very urgent. And our power of this coalition is our partners. And so I wanna take this opportunity to thank the partners who were part of the original authors of the, the federal recommendations, um, the members of our LinkedIn page that is growing rapidly, 
um, and the various supporters that have come to uh, a very big table uh, over the last few months to show their support and um, encouragement and partnership uh, in moving this coalition forward. Great, Stuart, take it away. Thanks, Marissa. Uh, again, welcome to everybody. Um, the next thing that we wanted to talk about um, very quickly was to just make one of our own little announcements. Um, as time has gone on, and already it's been four months, uh, we have started to try to create a little bit more structure, um, even as we're doing meetings um, with the White House and with committees and, and, and taking forward the recommendations that uh, this large group, many of whom are on the call right now, uh, worked on uh, together. Um, we also then started to get a lot of requests and a lot of lot more action around uh, what we were doing. And so um, we've put together a leadership circle from the group and taken input. Um, and we wanted to announce uh, the first, first group of that leadership circle. And the uh, idea being that because of invites, because of decisions that have to be made and, and, and because of the kinds of things that we're trying to do to get the recommendations out uh, in as many directions as possible, um, <laughs> no joking, the, 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 the voluntold nature of what um, we ended up doing for a while here um, was, uh, was, was starting to be too much. And so we, had an we have an amazing group that I want to announce tonight uh, for our leadership circle. Um, in no particular order, I just want to introduce you uh, if they're on here, not, not everybody will be, but I want to run through that list. Um, First person I want to mention is Ron Harris. He is not on yet, but he's the Chief Resilience Officer for Minneapolis. Um, he also chairs the uh, Racial Equity Through Resilience Community of Practice um, that we have at Resilient Cities Network. Um, the next person is Greg Wanell. He is with us, uh, who is the Director of the uh, Caribbean Green Technology Center um, on the Virgin Islands and co-lead of the uh, Hazard Mitigation Resilience Plan for the U.S. Virgin Islands. So uh, great to have him on with us. Um, the next person is Dr. Tia Martin, who um, is the CEO and founder of All Aces, um, but is also the former Chief Resilience Officer of Boston. So um, great to have you with us, uh, Dr. Martin. Um, the next person is Jade Begay. I don't think she was able to join us tonight. She's the uh, Climate Justice Campaign Director for Indian Collective, um, and that that family of organizations uh, where Nikki uh, comes from as well, who you'll hear from later. Um, Lorian uh, Farrell, who is the North America Director for Resilient Cities Network, uh, my closest um, resilience partner in crime. Um, I think she's on um, already. Um, and then uh, Yoka Argita Rocha, who is the Executive Director of the Clio Institute. Those of you who work in and around Florida probably know uh, Yoka and their work um, and their fellows amazing uh, organization. Um, the next person is Heather Rosenberg, who is the North America lead for Arup, um, who back in the 100 Resilient Cities days uh, was, a, was, a, was a real partner to the work that we were doing in a lot of the cities. Um, and then Alex, uh, I always call her Alex, but Alexandra McBride, who's the Chief Resilience Officer for, for Oakland um, in the Resilient Cities Network. Um, who has um, also been super active with our other committees um, and brings a, a, um, a, a very different view um, in the work that she's been doing in Oakland. And hopefully we'll have another session. We'll be able to hear from some of what she's doing. Um, and last but not least, uh, Dr. Lucy Jones, who is from the Lucy Jones Center for Science and Society. You, you may have known know her as the author of um, some fairly famous uh, seismic books and articles, um, maybe the big one or things like that. So um, uh, really pleased to have her join us as well. Um, and, and we'll probably add a few other people, but we wanted to make sure you started to, 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 to hear their names and, um, and some of them are gonna be speaking um, in a few moments. So um, I will, um, introduce the speakers as well and get us right into that section. And, and of course we can, we can as we've said, um, follow up with all the questions at, um, afterwards, but we really want to do be able to be able to hear from, uh, from all of our speakers and including some of those that, of, that I just mentioned that are joining the, the circle. And again, many, many thanks to that group of people. Um, and now that they've said yes, um, um, oh, and I skipped Janie, my goodness. Uh, Janie Bavishi is the director of the Office of Resilience for New York City. So um, I don't know how I did that, scrolling a little too fast in my list. Um, and I think she was going to be on tonight because we 
we have a little bit later time from our regular meetings. So sorry, Janie, that I missed you. Um, she was who I was thinking of when I said, it's not gonna be a heavy lift, um, but now we can really tell them how, how much we're gonna call on them. But um, really, really, really happy to have, have, have them all join us. So um, we put short bios for all the speakers um, up on the site. Um, and that's another way we're trying to like keep it pretty streamlined tonight. So I am just going to introduce each of the speakers one after the other um, and just with a couple lines and you can go see their full bios. Um, I don't think, uh, I don't think Brad put in his uh, seventh grade honor roll thing, but we have talked about that. Um, but what I will do is mention each of them and then turn it over to our first speaker who will be Samantha Medlock from the um, Select Committee on the Climate Crisis from the House. Um, but after Samantha, we'll have Mary McFadden join us um, from Enterprise, who um, many of you I'm sure already know from work at HUD in the Hurricane Task Force, but now uh, Senior Advisor for Resilience and Senior Vice President of Policy at Enterprise Community Partners. Uh, Marion, thanks, thanks for joining us today. Uh, after uh, Marion, we'll have uh, Dr. Martin will, um, will be speaking. Um, who I already introduced. And after uh, uh, Atia will be Amy Chester, who's the co-founder of the Resilience Pack, um, which she'll talk about tonight. Uh, but you may also know her as the Managing Director for Rebuild by Design and um, all that great work um, for the, from the, from leading from the Hurricane Task Force and, and uh, Hurricane Sandy work. Um, after Amy, um, we'll have Greg Bonnell from the U.S. Virgin Islands. And then after Greg is Julia Hustowit, um, who I used to work with at the Department of Housing and Urban Development, but is a for, former federal policy advisor there um, for climate change. Um, and uh, she's gonna run us through um, some things related to housing, which are pretty fantastic. And some of you who've been on LinkedIn have seen that already. Then we'll switch to Nikki Prados, who I work with closely, uh, managing director at Indian Fund um, as part of the Indian Collective family. And um, she's doing some exciting work um, as Indian Fund is uh, growing as a, as a native CDFI. Uh, and then Ron Harris will join us, the Chief Resilience Officer from, from Minneapolis, as I mentioned. And then um, Brad Dean, who is uh, running the Resilient Nations uh, Partnership Network for FEMA, um, will talk about uh, an exciting announcement that they have. So we're going to go straight through everybody, and then we'll open it up to questions. Um, so let me... Um, turn it over to Samantha. Take it away, Sam. Great, thanks very much. Really good to see you all. And I, I just want to again applaud the extraordinary work that everyone is doing um, in your day to day uh, and also coming together in this collective effort. Um, it's been extraordinarily helpful for us um, on Capitol Hill to be hearing from state and local leaders, from the tribes, from territories, from environmental justice community leaders and those on the front lines of the climate crisis, um, from uh, experts and practitioners at every level of government, from scientists, from youth activists that um, have been uh, helping to inform the work that we've um, been undertaking. Um, I, I think that it's also an exciting time um, having seen the, uh, the Congress through the last couple of years and the transition, um, there's a real spirit of optimism. I think that folks are uh, feeling the excitement, um, but that doesn't mean that we can in any way uh, rest on um, assumptions that having you know, the, the White House and the administration um, and the House and Senate, you know, rowing in some common directions. It's uh, still a tremendous amount of work. And a lot of times, as you all know, it, it comes down to the details. Um, even when we all can agree that, um, uh, that we need to be advancing on uh, clean energy, on justice and equity, um, uh, and on resilience, adaptation and preparedness, um, we still have a lot of work to do and a lot of education. Um, we also see an administration that is, uh, is, is gearing up um, against, you know, really significant challenges that were left behind by the previous administration with a massive brain drain, a real loss, especially in the science realm, 
and so I think that we, uh, while we are really excited to see the president leading from the front on day one, and it's um, an exciting week uh, where we are, you know, seeing announcements rolling out and a lot of this stuff is starting to come into focus, focus and, becoming, <laughs> and becoming real. We still, uh, you know, are, are needing to give the administration, give the White House uh, as much technical help as they can get and feeding the perspectives of you all directly into oh. their work, into the implementation of that work is really important. Um, and similarly for the Congress. I'm gonna take a little bit of time and uh, you know, brag on some of the things that have been achieved. Um, we did manage to get some very good legislation all the way across mm -hmm. and, uh, and signed into law. Um, everything from the, uh, the American Rescue Plan, a lot of the recovery packages that did, that did get enacted, um, work on the, the Clean Future Act, um, you know, everything from you know, getting things like Digital Coast uh, and, um, and uh, you know, some of these bills that are, are moving funding uh, into law. I think there's lots of uh, reasons for um, optimism um, on environmental justice with the American Rescue Plan. $100 million for environmental justice grants is incredible, uh, but it's a great start. Um, and so where we're seeing uh, grants to identify and address the disproportionate environmental and public harms, uh, impacts and risks to vulnerable populations. That's great progress, but we still have more to go. Uh, we do see good increased funding for agriculture and our, our farmers helping with emergency rural development grants for rural health care, farm loan assistance, um, loans and grants to improve uh, uh, food and agriculture supply resilience. These are, are really good steps forward, but we've got a long way to go. Um, we've seen in the Recovery Act um, good advancements in the global health security, disease detection and response, um, health data modernization and forecast, uh, good work for the public health workforce and medical reserve corps, and uh, funding for the Indian Health Service. Uh, but those are down payments on what we need to be doing. Um, we, go, we do see um, some progress on housing and community development. Um, funding that can be used by states for infrastructure on things like broadband. Um, we, uh, we saw a lot through the year-end omnibus on housing and community resilience uh, through some of the tax credits for states hit by natural disasters. We see good direction going to housing and urban development for uh, CDBG grantees efforts to use funds to increase resilience and hardened structures so that they can better withstand flooding and severe storms and other natural hazards. Um, good efforts to prioritize um, on Native American program funding and technical assistance. Um, but we've got so much farther to go yet. Um, we're really excited by the, uh, the permanent funding or the, the permanent availability for land and water conservation fund and the Great American Outdoors Act. We do see good funding flowing uh, to the Department of Interior to be um, helping to protect and preserve public lands um, that can be building resilience and also increasing carbon sequestration. Um, funding for uh, uh, watershed and flood prevention efforts through Interior. Um, funding for the Coral Reef Program uh, to research and combat uh, harmful algal blooms. The Water Resources De Development Act also, I think, included some very good direction to Army Corps of Engineers, but I think a lot of the real efficacy there is going to come through the implementation, right? You know, where we do see direction to Army Corps to consider the needs of communities that are requesting assistance with sea level rise and, uh, and to you know, show more of their math on how they're calculating sea level rise benefits for Army Corps projects. Um, and direction to the core to help economically disadvantaged communities to address repeated flooding. Um, that's great direction, but I think what we're all watching for is how Army Corps is gonna go about implementing all of that direction, including you know, how they're gonna document consideration of uh, nature-based, um, uh, natural and nature-based solutions for floods and coastal storms. Um, we also have a long way to go to 
implement what we see coming through the White House with the American Jobs Plan. Uh, so I want to wrap up because we've got a lot more to hear, but there's work underway um, in, a, in a strategy to better integrate carbon mitigation, resilience, and preparedness into a comprehensive climate agenda, uh, to strengthen the role of natural systems, uh, to develop the body of science um, and inform decisions uh, with actionable climate risk information, uh, to translate all of that into uh, federal codes and standards for siting and design, um, and to embed resilience into the infrastructure bills, uh, bills for housing and disaster recovery. Um, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting into this with you all. We cannot do it without you. Um, and so I'm going to wrap up there. There's a lot more that we could go into, but I really want to hear from uh, from the rest of the folks that are going to be talking with us tonight. So it's my pleasure to turn it over to Marianne McFadden with Enterprise Community Partners. Um, look forward to uh, the discussion. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, Sam. Sam. So um, I'm Marianne McFadden with Enterprise Community Partners. I have been working with disaster impacted communities one way or another since 9-11, um, so almost uh, 20 years now. So I am just so thrilled to see that we have built the resilience field and how many people are passionate and talking about the many different ways that we should be advancing resilience. So I'm primarily gonna talk about federal policy and, and programs. Um, but I do have to do some shout outs to some of the amazing people here. During the Obama administration, I got to work on the federal Hurricane Sandy task force, um, which Carrie Whitehead and Scott, David, Scott Davis helped create by creating the executive order. And then through the Sandy task force, we co-created the Rebuild by Design um, effort, which Amy Chester is joining us. She's going to talk about and Rebuild by Design led to the National Disaster Resilience Competition. Um, again, with these folks and with Julia Hustwit and many others who are here. Um, and in, in all of that, we demonstrated that you could take this agency, which is dedicated um, to serving the poorest Americans and help them prepare for the changing climate and bring together um, not just those federal dollars, but use private sector money from philanthropy to bring in new, creative, innovative ways of preparing and thinking ahead about the climate risks that communities are facing. Um, so I think it's really exciting to think about the fact that you have many folks back in the federal government now who lived through that. And uh, the primary call out I would have there would be Kevin Bush. So Kevin Bush was there for all of those disasters and for um, the federal flood risk management standard that we helped much uh, create with much support from Sam Medlock from her role then in the White House. Um, so I know that with Kevin, HUD is in the best of hands and I think we're gonna see some big changes in practice that come from the big ideas. Um, I left government after all those years because I felt like to really change those HUD programs, I was actually going to have to step outside of HUD. I had been a career employee and then I was a presidential appointee. And I said, I think I'm really going to need to go to the private sector to jump in and talk about what needs to be changed. And Enterprise Community Partners was very attractive to me as a place to go and do that um, because my enterprise colleagues have been working with disaster impacted communities um, and low income communities um, since hurricanes Katrina, Rita and Wilma um, starting in around 2005. Um, about the same time we created the Enterprise Green Communities Standard, um, which Lauren Westmoreland's joining us tonight. Um, and happy to give her a shout out because she has helped to get more than 30 jurisdictions to adopt the use of these green standards um, for their creation of new affordable housing and renovation of housing through the low income housing tax credit. So I think about these enterprise uh, green communities criteria as being like a lead standard for building, um, but uniquely designed around the needs of um, residents of modest means and the developers and owners of their apartment buildings. Um, we recently redid the criteria for 2020 um, and bulked up the resilience standards. So um, we're really excited to see that all of the jurisdictions who adopted them previously 
uh, re-upped and opted into the new standards. So um, between what the federal government's gonna do and what the states have decided to do for the lion's share of creation of affordable housing in the country, I'm, I'm really deeply optimistic. Um, so on the, on the policy side of things, um, I was really excited to step away from the federal government and start to push um, Congress and the public to think about the many tens of billions that have been poured into HUD's programs. So everybody thinks about FEMA and its incredible role um, in doing emergency response and long-term recovery. But after the worst disasters, right? So things like 9-11 and Katrina um, and Hurricane Sandy um, and Irma and Maria, um, the wildfires uh, for several years in California, tornadoes, right? The, the really big ones. Congress individually appropriates emergency money to HUD for the Community Development Block Grant Disaster Recovery Program. But it's not like FEMA or SBA dollars in that there's not a permanent program there with regular regulations. So the jurisdictions who are receiving the money, and I see lots of uh, friends out in the audience um, from jur jurisdictions that have gone through this, um, the jurisdictions don't know what the rules are gonna be. They can't plan ahead. When the disaster happens, they don't know if any money's actually gonna come. But then when HUD does an uh, allocation of funding, um, it's still a really long time before they can lift off their programs. It's, you know, nine months or more of back of the house um, planning and getting systems in place. Um, and Urban Institute recently did a study that it takes on average 20 months to lift off a housing recovery program after a disaster. So really in thinking about how we help communities recover better and thinking about how we make low income people more resilient, we need to be, be quicker. We need to meet the expectations of community members and doing this work for 20 years. I have never once gone to a community that said, oh, you know, recovery was fast enough and the handoff between FEMA and HUD was really seamless. Um, so long story short, maybe it's too late. Um, we've been working on permanently authorizing the program. And in the last Congress, we got um, a bipartisan victory. So the House actually um, passed the CDBGDR authorization bill on a wide bipartisan margin. Uh, it was just picking up speed in the Senate uh, before the last Congress closed. So we're optimistic we'll, we'll get in there. Um, and that would include um, really baking in resilience standards permanently. But the truth is, we shouldn't be using just disaster programs to advance resilience standards. So in the Obama administration, by the end, we got as far as saying, okay, for, for rebuilding after disasters, you've got really pretty good standards. Um, we got to the federal flood risk management standard, uh, then that went away, and now the administration, um, the Biden-Harris administration brought it back, so that's great. But we really have work to do to actually put building standards in place for all federally funded construction to ensure that our taxpayer investments are not contributing to climate change and are resilient to the changes that are yet to come. So, um, it, you know, we're advocating for that in every way we can on the Hill with agencies um, and simultaneously working to help the affordable housing industry understand um, what can be done, what can be done in terms of building practices um, so at this moment in time, I'm deeply optimistic. It's so inspiring to see the leadership coming out of the White House um, and the continued interest on the Hill. Um, and so I think that we need to keep the ideas flowing. I'm so grateful to the R21 team for putting such awesome policy recommendations together and just really encourage all of you to continue to be a voice of what's working and what needs to be changed because we just need to keep telling the stories because stories are what lodge in people's brains. And we know that, the, you know, no success story is too small at this point. Thanks. Thanks, Marion. Um, and you can see why we kicked things off with Samantha and Marion. Um, and uh, a, lot to, a lot to think about and, and a lot of um, amazing stuff coming through in the chat. We are recording this 
Um, and so we'll we'll be able to to refer back to your notes. So uh, don't feel like it's one of those situations where you've put something in the chat and there's like this eureka moment with some other person. Uh, we'll we'll be able to pull that out. Um, we're gonna we're gonna shift gears a little bit um, and and dig in and turn to um, Dr. Tia Martin and um, hear from her and then uh, Amy, Greg, Julia, Nikki. And I did hear from Ron. He'll be on shortly uh, and then finish up with Brad. So. Um, Tia, yeah, turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Stuart. And um, I put this in the chat, but I want to uh, reinforce it. I just want to say thank you for your leadership, for Lori's leadership. Um, and, and I think um, uh, from and Marissa's leadership, and I think from a um, moving forward perspective and all of the work that we have on our plate, um, I'm just honored to be here with all of you this evening. So happy Wednesday to everyone. Um, so I'm going to be uh, pretty quick. Um, when I was the Chief Resilience Officer, we had just transitioned from um, talking about resilience as bouncing back to bouncing forward. And I think intellectually, we knew kind of what that meant. We knew that it meant that uh, whenever we had the opportunity during the mitigation, all the way through to recovery, that we could make sure we built things back better. And that was the framing we often talked about. How do we make sure that we learn from the impacts of disasters, of emergencies, and make sure that we're embedding um, these more proactive um, and intentional ways that we prevent the impact from threats and disasters that we face in the first place? One thing we still struggle with um, and has been an ongoing struggle for us in the resilience space, broad speaking resilience, climate resilience, and everything in between to all of the many disciplines that fall within us that all of us here represent, um, is what it means to bounce forward in a way that acknowledges that um, there are some social realities in our communities. There's, there's humanity um, that's involved of people um, and the ways that we oftentimes approach resilience reduces um, uh, the social equity and racial equity challenges to um, kind of social resilience and then like a sub, sub, sub category within social resilience. So we don't necessarily always bring that thread throughout all of the different domains of resilience. So we think about infrastructure resilience, when we think about economic resilience, environmental resilience, social resilience, um, that all of those domains of resilience need us to be proactively thinking about um, what ways we can, what are the ways that we can embed racial equity and social justice into our efforts in a very intentional, proactive way? And what does that, what does that mean? So that means, number one, that we acknowledge that there are differences in how people are experiencing society in general on a day-to-day -day basis. And that we're also acknowledging that the way people have experienced disasters and emergencies are different because we have made decisions as a society at a policy level that were exclusionary up front intentionally and that we have built so much on top of it without addressing some of the um, parts of the system that reinforce inequities, uh, including um, us as, in the ways that we reinforce it. So as chief resilience officer, one of the things I was tasked with was connecting the dots between racial equity, social justice and resilience. And what does that mean for uh, the city of Boston? What does it mean in general? And what does it mean for the city of Boston? Um, and I wanna give a shout out to some of my fellow Bostonians who are here, who are still practitioners in the space um, on behalf of um, government. Um, and so we have Sanjay who, who's here from the environment department uh, for the city of Boston. And we also have Nancy Smith who's here from the Boston Public Health Commission, both of them involved in trying to do mitigation work. And I say this whole piece around um, racial equity and social justice embedding that into the work because it's never happened by accident. We have never arrived at equitable outcomes by tripping into it. The intentionality required to embed it is significant. And one of the ways that uh, I thought was important for the resilient strategy process that we used in Boston um, that has uh, been so meaningful and powerful for me has been the community engagement part of it because voice and choice, when we take away people's voice and choice as part of resilience efforts and process and decision-making, we oftentimes are perpetuating inequities without meaning to do so. 
and and it helps us as practitioners because we don't have all the context. Many of us are technical experts. Where I was joking earlier that you know many of us are intellectual rock stars, and the communities that we're trying to um, be in service of um, are the context experts, and we need their context in order to come up with the best approaches and solutions. So even the most well designed um, technical approaches are going to be missing some context because we're just people and we don't have all the context um, without seeking that information. And so an important part of the work in Boston was really about going to where people are, um, riding buses, riding trains, um, going to events, communities we're already having. And I bring that up in this context because um, the intentionality that it takes to advance racial equity and social justice as part of resilience um, takes a, a, a level of extra work. Um, a lot of the right things to do take extra work. Um, and so I think for us in this space to also, um, as we think about voice and choice of community, to also be thinking about a fifth domain of resilience that um, is uh, we oftentimes talk about, but we talk about it in a bureaucratic way and that's governance. We talk about governance oftentimes as different levels of government. Sometimes we include the private sector, sometimes we include NGOs, but I would uh, challenge us to also in to think about um, community-based grassroots organizations and civic infrastructure people um, because the, the decisions about um, how we respond, how we recover, how we mitigate, how we deal with the climate crisis um, that is a shared struggle for all of us um, requires us to have as many um, committed people and minds uh, that care about these issues working collaboratively together. And then the last thing I just wanted to share is, um, you know, this embedding equity and talking about it and advocating it in different spaces is a lot of work. It's challenging. It means uh, a lot of uh, conflict management because it makes people uncomfortable. And I, my hope for everyone is that we're able to find it within ourselves um, to build the knowledge, skills, and tools necessary in order to do that kind of advocacy in the spaces when it's most uncomfortable um, to make sure that the considerations get embedded into the work that we're doing. I'll leave you with a quote because y'all, for people who know me know that I'm, a, I'm crazy about quotes and I love them dearly. Um, one of them um, I used to say a lot when I was chief resilience officer, I actually used to end every presentation with this quote. Um, and uh, it resurfaced for me again today um, in another conversation. And so that's the one I'm going to share with you today. Um, and it is that most people do not recognize opportunity because it comes disguised as hard work. Most people do not recognize opportunity because it comes disguised as hard work. And I cannot claim credit for that quote. There's debate about who said it. If you do the googly thing, you'll see the debate. Ultimately, I got it from a Salata tea bag, and I hope that you are also able, not afraid, to find wisdom wherever it shows up to inspire you to continue to do the work and to find the strength in our own individual resilience to continue to do this work and advocate in the ways that we need to. So thank you very much. And I get to pass it on to Amy Chester, who is going to, who is the co-founder of the Resilience Pack and Managing Director of Rebuild by Design. Thank you, Amy, for all of your work over the years and looking forward to hear, hearing you this evening. Thanks, Atiyah. Thank you, Atiyah. It's so good to be here with you and everyone else. <laughs> One second, I'm sharing my screen. Um, so hi, everybody. I'm Amy Chester, and I am so tired about talking about climate resilience. I spend all day working on climate adaptation locally, nationally, and internationally. The organization I lead began in the wake of Hurricane Sandy, and that was eight years ago. Um, but people are not taking it serious enough. Yes, New York City has divested in fossil fuel, we have painted roofs, we have added green space, we've invested in select large scale projects, but we have a really long time to go until um, we can have a plan that is comprehensive for what will happen when New York City sees three to six feet of sea level rise and how it will compound our existing affordability crises, our equity issues and our aging infrastructure. We no longer have time to wait. Um, adaptation is not very sexy. We have to make it really sexy. Students aren't marching in the street, sorry, students are marching in the street against carbon, but not for retreat. 
So we have to make it um, upon ourselves to make these issues current, to hold our elected officials accountable, and to get people really excited about this. Um, so I want to introduce to you uh, Resilience Pack. Uh, it's, a, a, it's a volunteer single issue political action committee to influence the New York City elections on resilience. The idea is that we get candidates to commit to climate adaptation practices before they are elected. So when they take office, they will take immediate action on creating an equitable path called um, towards climate resilience. Um, this year is really huge in our city. It happens about once every eight years where the mayor and most of the city council members are up at the same time. We currently have 31 candidates running for mayor. So we have a huge opportunity to educate um, and to make a big change. It's not advancing, one second. So how has this come together? Um, well, I recruited a colleague um, and then we recruited some friends and then they recruited some colleagues and some friends. And in the past 12 months, we've created an organization of citizen experts to hold our government accountable. We strive to be as diverse as New York City is. We are ecologists, educators, architects, engineers, policy and communication specialists, lawyers, advocates, government employees, residents of flood plain, flood, flood prone neighborhoods and we are voters and we're all doing it on our own time. We work together to create a mission to help elect candidates who are dedicated to ensuring that all of New York City's people, community and neighborhoods thrive amid the challenges of climate change. Our goal is to enhance the diverse communities and ecologies that contribute to New York's unique character and quality of life. We especially want to ensure that people of color and low-income communities across the five boroughs are able to pursue safe and happy lives, healthy lives, in the context of climate change and can participate in conversations and decisions on related issues and policies that affect their own future. Each candidate that we will endorse um, will support uh, adapting to climate change. We'll, uh, sorry, each candidate we support understands that adapting to climate change requires holistic responses that identify intersecting, intersecting stressors and develop solutions that address social, ecological, and physical vulnerabilities simultaneously. So with our endorsement power, we're hoping to build a grassroots membership of folks from across the city to create a support system for climate resilience. And we do that by A, educating candidates, two, B, evaluating candidates, three, endorsing the candidates that we want to rise up to the top, um, four, electing them by working on GOTV, and then holding them accountable once they are in office. We've developed, um, oh, actually, where we are right now is actually the, we created a two-stage endorsement process. We just passed the first stage, and we have, um, these are the mayoral candidates who have, um, who have already gotten the first stage nod, and we're interviewing all of them this week. Um, here's some of our very first uh, successes. So we know that it's working. Our initial meeting about a year ago had 24 people. Um, since then, we've been building this movement. We have contacted 400 campaigns um, that, are work that are running for city council and uh, local offices in New York City. More than 100 of them have attended our candidate class. And actually, right now, we have one going on about the intersection of resilience and housing in New York City. Um, and that's where Lorian is at this moment speaking. Um, we have uh, 163 candidates who have completed our four-part questionnaire, which talks about what their specific ideas are for resilience. We created a process to um, look through all those questionnaires. We had 18 people reviewing questionnaires, and we have decided that 78 of them move on to the next stage. We have invited 50 of those candidates for interviews, and we are doing um, all the citywide candidates this week. We're not sure how many we're going to endorse. Um, wanted to talk to you about this today um, because I think you all know my, my regular job. We've talked about it for a long time, but this is something different, and this is something you can do too. We have created this with an eye towards doing it in other cities and to um, ensure that other cities can learn from us and that we can learn from them. So if you're interested, um, please let us know. We would love to work with you on seeding this, and you can also join us. You don't have to be a New York City um, uh, resident to join us. Um, or you can donate at Resilience Pack and of course, follow us on social media. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Um, and again, thanks, uh, Atiyah. You can see uh, 
when Atia refer, refers to uh, going from the political to the civic and from the civic to the political, um, the kinds of powers that, uh, that we can have. And this is a, this is a unique uh, and unusual example. Um, and it's great that others that are part of this group have gotten involved as well. <laughs> and as, uh, as Amy said, Lorian, uh, who I mentioned earlier and my closest coworker at Resilient Cities is, is over there on that call, uh, uh, chairing that right now. Um, so it's great to have so much uh, cross uh, filterization and it's, it goes back to what Marissa said at the beginning about the partnerships. Uh, that makes such a difference here. So um, now we're going to dig even deeper into some of the um, the activities uh, locally, as well as um, some of the specific changes and in, in, in areas that we want to talk about. Um, Amy mentioned housing in New York City, but we're going to talk about uh, HUD and uh, a few other places. Um, at first, we're going to uh, turn towards uh, the U.S. Virgin Islands and uh, Greg Winnell. Um, who I introduced earlier is gonna is gonna take it away from here for um, his few minutes. Yes. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for thanks, for having me and thanks for participating to this really exciting event. Um, so my name is Greg Guanell. I'm the uh, director for the Caribbean Wind Technology Center at UBI. I'm also the co-lead of the update of the hazard mitigation plan for the territory of the Virgin Islands. It's a it's a great effort that. Um, UVI is leading in partnership with uh, VITIMA, the local uh, emergency management agency, and uh, our main partner, the SHMO, uh, Ms. Graciela Rivera, is actually um, attending this call. So saying hello to Graciela. Um, so yes, um, the uh, Virgin Island, we've been working for almost two years now on updating the hazard mitigation plan. It's, uh, some of you might maybe rise, raise an eyebrow at the word two years, but um, the reason why we're taking so long is because we are sort of digging deeper into why we are so vulnerable to the impact of disasters. So really asking the question of, you know, what, what happened really during the 2017 hurricanes, what's happening since then in terms of the various hazards and impacts, um, natural events that have impacted us, and what can we do about it? And so after spending a lot of time thinking about how to frame this, we decided to really anchor our approach on really asking the question, what is exactly is well-being for communities in the Virgin Island? The Virgin Island is mostly uh, a majority Black, majority Hispanic uh, population. So the type of question and approaches in the Virgin Island are very different from uh, some of what some of our great colleagues uh, mentioned earlier in terms of this question of resilience and equity for communities. And so what we're doing is really sort of asking the question, how can we ensure that people have what they need? How can we ensure that the services get delivered to people? And that led us to basically take a very sort of systems approach to, to our work. And so for the hazard mitigation plan, we are looking at 13 different systems, uh, the economy, the housing, the health, the power, the water, et cetera, the culture and arts, the communities themselves, the ecosystems, and really sort of asking the question, how do these systems work? How does the service that they provide is produced? How is it distributed? And how is it received? And how do hazards and disruption really prevent it from, from, from the, the customer, the, the people, the residents, the communities from receiving that service? And so the, the, the main thing that we sort of discovered um, as we were sort of making this investigation is that a lot of systems operators, a lot of people who operate all the systems that we depend on don't really know the vulnerabilities of their systems. A lot of time we find that there are pieces out there. We have actually everything we need to be resilient, but since we don't know what it takes to be resilient and since we don't know how those systems react and what those systems have and what those vulnerabilities are, then we become more uh, 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 vulnerable and we fail during some of those disruptions. So a lot of our work is really sort of uncovering for all the different systems and there are 13 of them that we're looking at, essential services, critical infrastructure, but also communities, ecosystems, etc. really sort of decomposing them into their different pieces and then asking the question, how do this question affect them? And what we found is really sort of you know, and that's something that many others have said, um, is that uh, there is a lot of failure point in many systems and we cannot prevent that from happening. 
But what we can do is we can act. And a lot of time buying things and, and building things is important to build robustness. But uh, ultimately what we find is resilience is a lot about what we do, not exactly what we have. And so as we make our analysis, we're really asking, okay, how are we doing? How do we know how we're doing? How do they know how we're doing? And based on that, are they able to anticipate and adapt to disruption? And, and we're learning a lot about asking this type of question to various system operators about exactly what their vulnerabilities are, but also we come up with ideas on how to then mitigate against those impacts of disasters. And again, those go beyond just buying new things and really about operation, about how we do things and what is it that we do on a regular basis, not exactly what we have. And then the last question is, you know, do you, did you learn from, from your experience and does that change the way that you know how you're doing? So that's really the sense of understanding what's happening in your systems. So that's a lot of what we're doing. We are pretty much done with our effort. There is, it's, a, it's been a very uh, eye-opening, um, sometimes challenging um, sort of effort. But um, we're now sort of finalizing our effort and um, coming up with, you know, type of recommendation that will, you know, suggest to, to increase the robustness of system by buying things and investing in things, but also asking the question and providing options for, for residents, for communities to build some of their own systems themselves to ensure that they have what they need. And having what you need is, is not just a question of, amount of, but just the right amount to, to, to allow you to go and move forward when you have a disruption. So those options, those mitigation strategies will really depend on different sort of who our sort of communities are and what are their sort of socioeconomic level and ability to, you know, move on uh, after disaster. We're going to put a lot of emphasis on operation, building and, and, and having things important, but it really won't guarantee the ability to deliver the service. So really a lot of importance on the operation of things. And so we're going to have, uh, after we submit our plan, we have a, a, a basically a whole plan to uh, build capacity, training, collaboration, emphasize the need for collaboration inter-island with other islands and also increase community cohesion. Some of my colleagues uh, tonight mentioned the, the role of community cohesion, and that really is a, a great pathway to increasing resilience uh, in a territory to hazard and to the impact of climate change. So really exciting work, challenging work, but uh, really happy to do it and uh, very happy to rely on all those great colleagues uh, uh, from Laurie Stewart and everybody else in the great team of Resilience 21 to really help us think through these problems and come up with innovative solutions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Greg. Always great to hear from you and, and your, your amazing innovations working out of the university there in the Virgin Islands and, and the work that you're doing. Um, and uh, there's, there were some, some questions for you in particular and requests, so we can send the chat to you if we don't get them in the, in, in the question period. Um, shifting gears a little bit, uh, let's go to Julia. Uh, are you ready to bring up your slides? I'm not going to use slides, just me talking tonight. Okay, great. <laughs> um, so hi, everyone. I'm Julia Hustwit. I'm really honored to be here tonight talking with all of you, especially some of my previous colleagues um, and a lot of really awesome, talented people here on the phone tonight. Um, as Stuart mentioned earlier, I spent about a decade combating climate change at HUD, but I left the agency during the previous administration. So my remarks tonight represent my personal views. Um, I've recently prepared a comprehensive strategy that maps out in detail how HUD can pick up on the interrupted initiatives and ensure that we meet our 20 and 30 and 2050 climate goals and promote smart development in other concrete ways. Um, if you'd like to get a copy of that report, just connect with me on LinkedIn and I'll make sure to get it over to you. Um, tonight, I'm going to talk about some of the most important steps that the new administration can take uh, through HUD if it wants to help communities and the nation as a whole strengthen its resilience to the impacts of the climate crisis that are already inevitable. I'd love to outline the full resilience plan for the agency, but we won't have enough time for that. Um, so I'm going to take an opportunity to focus in on something that's very specifically 
an issue of national policy. I know that's a little different for um, a lot of you who are working really at the local level. And so hopefully you'll find it interesting and relevant. Um, but I wasn't sure exactly who was gonna be on the phone tonight. And this is gonna be about HUD's role in managing the risk that climate change presents to the housing market, which is something I think that we don't necessarily talk about as much as we should. Uh, macroeconomics can feel a little bit distant to some of us. So we'll just take a quick uh, trip back through history for a moment and refresh our memories about its relevance to, to everyday life. Um, undoubtedly, everyone here remembers the devastation of the Great Recession just a decade ago, the housing market built on a shaky foundation of risky mortgages and inaccurate assessments of that risk collapsed. And it took major banks and the global economy with it. Unemployment skyrocketed. There were 3.8 million foreclosures. Families lost their life savings and the roofs over their head. It was a really scary time for a lot of us. And unless you were one of the few people who were smart enough to short the bond market, market, not um, a time that any of us really would wish to relive. But even worse um, than that was the Great Depression, something we really only probably remember from high school history class. It coincided with one of America's worst ever natural disasters. In the 1930s, on the heels of the famous stock market crash and the collapse of half of America's banks, a combination of unsustainable farming practices, extreme heat and drought created a decade-long natural disaster known as the Dust Bowl. For those living in it, it was a real-life horror. Millions of Americans struggled to find food and water. American children were crippled by malnutrition, rickets, and dust pneumonia. Um, uh, millions of small farms and family homes were foreclosed, sometimes begrudgingly sold to speculators or simply abandoned. 2.5 million Americans fled their homes at that time in a mass interstate migration that led to squalid refugee camps and the kind of suffering we really don't imagine is being possible in the United States. Um, but it, it happened and um, unfortunately could happen again. Those events, the 2008 housing market crash and the 1930s Dust Bowl, they're not just flips. While it wouldn't look identical again today, due to the effects of climate change, it's actually estimated that Another same size dust bowl in the American heartland could uh, is about two and a half times as likely now as it was 100 years ago. And of course, that's just one type of threat amongst many. Um, the Union of Concerned Scientists recently projected that 300,000 of the current mortgages in the United States are already at risk from climate change. And then that number is going to skyrocket to about 2.4 million within several decades. Such levels of default threaten not only those individual families who live in the homes, but also the government tax bases at the community levels where a lot of you work. Um, and of course, the larger economy. The UN estimates as well that in 30 years, there could be as many as 200 million climate refugees in the world, a portion of whom will be Americans and far more who will be arriving on our border in a state of desperation. So the good news is that the Biden administration is making really a lot of laudable pledges about how it's going to address the climate crisis. But Sam Medlock mentioned earlier something that I really want to emphasize myself, which is that we are not going to meet those goals that the administration is making unless we take a whole of government approach from the local to the federal with um, at least the level of mobilization that we've seen during the pandemic, if not as much mobilization as we saw during World War II. We have to staff up, staff up and infuse the federal government as well as local governments with workers who can kind of efficiently and effectively transform federal policy and programs in all of the wonk minutia that's necessary. Um, and as Marion mentioned earlier, you know, resilience has um, been something that HUD has driven predominantly through its CDBG block grant programs, uh, but it's really something that has to happen throughout the entire agency. Um, and I came more from a housing side of the office compared to Marion and um, some of the others on the phone when I was there. Um, but a lot of the recommendations that I'm making in my report talk about how every program office within HUD really needs to be making specific policy changes that will address resilience. Um, 
So getting back to it, PUD plays a very special role in the federal response to the climate crisis. At the top of many people's minds, like I was saying before, are the CDBG block grant programs. And at the current moment, um, hopefully it'll change like Marion was saying, but at the current moment that money is really, an, it comes on an ad hoc basis. Um, but the agency does have the potential to make a lot of impact on resilience through its core policies and programs. And very critically, it houses millions of low and moderate income Americans. Um, and the wealth built, through, excuse me, through its affordable housing programs and its home ownership programs, the wealth built through those home ownership programs has been the backbone of middle class. Um, wealth in the country and the critical path out of poverty for millions of Americans over the last century. Um, the way that HUD assists those families <clears throat> is predominantly by providing mortgage insurance, and that makes banks more willing to provide loans to families for um, property types, for instance, um, affordable housing properties that otherwise wouldn't be served by the market and, and families that might not otherwise be served by the market. <clears throat> so as I mentioned earlier, climate change increases the risk of default on a growing number of American homes. In fact, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen recently cited climate change as the single biggest threat to U.S. financial markets. And the Treasury and the Federal Housing Finance Agency, which is FHFA and not the same agency as HUD, um, they've started to step up and, and kind of try to do some research on this subject to try to understand how they can start to protect the financial markets from the kind of um, default risk that's presented by climate change. And I'm hoping in, that HUD's going to be starting to do the same kind of thing. It, it really does need to. Um, Notably, large real estate companies and speculators already are compiling their own proprietary research on this subject. And so you're getting kind of a disparity between the people who have the information and the people who don't. Uh, people who have the information can protect themselves and they can um, protect their investments. Those who, can't, who don't have that information can't. And right now the federal government, affordable housing providers, small communities who aren't as perhaps as sophisticated as New York City, for example, and regular American families, they don't have that. So um, ultimately to address the risk in the housing market and to be able to make any kind of data-driven decisions about policy and funding by the federal government or local governments, by the public or even individual families, the federal government really needs to be able to um, offer a robust forward-looking data system that allows decision makers to assess climate risks and vulnerabilities from the national level all the way down to the property level. Many pieces of that data platform have already been built by the federal government, most notably FEMA's recent publication of the National Risk Index, which is really awesome. But the full system um, doesn't exist yet, and it really uh, needs to be a priority of the new administration, because once that data is available to people, once the tools are there so that people can really start to understand what kind of risks are faced by, um, you know, what risks they face at their own, in their own home, but also uh, for developers of affordable housing more broadly, for instance, in communities, um, that's when we can start to make better policy and funding decisions, and we can start to right size pricing of mortgage insurance, which will, which will then protect uh, the housing market. Um, so someone that's on the phone, one of my old colleagues, Ted Toon, he knows about this uh, really well because he is somebody who pushed for uh, mortgage uh, insurance premium discounts for green building uh, improvements and uh, green building standards uh, for single family and affordable housing uh, through HUD's programs. And that really kind of um, is a, a really wonderful precedent for how uh, the mortgage insurance premium discounts can be used to start to 
again, right price, um, the risk in the housing market, but also to incentivize people to start investing in resilient improvements and resilient construction and in the lo in location choices that um, are, are going to be really essential down the line. Um, so in conclusion, there's a lot of work that HUD needs to do, and this is just one aspect of it, that data work is gonna form the basis for this kind of uh, policy and funding decisions down the line. And uh, I'm gonna stop talking there. <laughs> if you guys have questions about other aspects of HUD's work um, and what it can be doing, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to talk about them as well. And I will pass the mic on to our next speaker. Thanks, Julia. Um, you, you really hit on some of the things that Samantha and Marion brought up at the beginning, where a lot of Resilience 21 was feeling like, uh, even in the jobs plan, it's not the what, there's some good stuff in there. It's a lot of the how, and it's all these pieces that you're describing that we're trying to weave together. So um, super on point and reinforces a lot of what's already been said. Um, we could uh, not to bore other people to tears, but we could do a special session on HUD, no problem, uh, and, and, and dig in. Um, so I'm going to switch over to Nikki Prados, uh, my colleague at uh, Indian Fund, an Indian collective, um, and let her take it away. And then um, after that, we've got Ron and Brad to, to close up the night. So uh, over to you, Nikki. Thank you. Um, and yeah, very, very many throwback conversations with um, HUD and FEMA on the line. So yeah, greetings to all. Buju, Dinoe Maganiduk, Nikki Pradis, Indigena Kaz, Makwa and Duda, Monamani, Zagi Gung and Dunjaba. Just said hello relatives, because we are all related. Um, I'm Nikki Pradis. I am Bear Clan, which one aspect of being Bear Clan means your community protector, which resonates with all of us here and the work that we do. I'm also Anishinaabe from the beautiful Lake Vermilion side of the Boys Fort Nation in northern Minnesota, um, but I am calling in from home office um, on Dakota and Anishinaabe lands in Minneapolis tonight. Um, I'm also the managing director of Indian Fund, a national lead of CDFI and lending arm of Indian Collective, which is an all indigenous organization. And our overall mission is to build the collective power of indigenous peoples, communities, and nations to exercise our inherent right to self-determination while fostering a world that is built on a foundation of justice and equity for all people and planet. So all of our work is movement building work, justice work in many different forms. Um, for example, our literal bodies are on the front lines defending our lands and the health of our present and future generations against fossil fuel giants and pipelines like KXL, DAPL, and now in our Anishinaabe homelands, Enbridge is line three. Um, so that's a part of the work. On the other side, the grant making and lending side of our work provides tools and resources to, to fund and build alternatives to extractive systems. So on the lending side, we focus on renewables, infrastructure, regenerative ag, housing, and social enterprise. And really everything centers on shifting decision-making and the way that society invests in indigenous communities. And as some of you who know me <laughs> also know, I can be a long-winded storyteller, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna be brief tonight. Um, so in sharing kind of the history of why NDN or why Indian Collective is a member and partner, of R21 or Resilience 21, it's actually, it's actually pretty simple. I previously knew uh, Stuart from his work in the native CDFI world, which is also where you know I have a background in. And I came across an article he wrote in Shelter Force on LinkedIn. Um, and so after joining Indian Collective a couple years ago, I thought, you know, my job here is not about capital flow, or it's not just about capital flow, or bringing in a large influx of development projects into Indian country. My job is to help provide capacity to our communities and businesses to plan and operate in a seventh generation mindset. And in a way that, you know, honors the importance of place, our lands as a living entity, our knowledge and our future generations. And so then I'm on LinkedIn and then I see this headline that says resilience 101 community development fits well within the growing resilience movement and connecting the two more explicitly 
could make their work even more powerful. And so understanding, right, it's not just enough to be sustainable. Resilience is a step beyond that. So anyways, and here we are. So <laughs> I think others have talked really um, well about the values and visions of, you know, their work that also aligns with R21 and what it can continue to do to inform public policy legislation, national coalitions, lending, philanthropy, economic development, engineering. I mean, there's just so much more, right? But I think for me and for many other indigenous peoples and those most impacted by climate change, uh, pandemics like COVID-19, man-made natural disasters, police violence, um, and the prison industrial complex, and simply put, um, Western reductionist and oppressive systems. Groups like R21 are promoting and amplifying collective solutions, right, that are inclusive and they center us. So that's so important. Um, and we're seeing our administration doing that as well, which is very uplifting. Um, so at Indian Fund, um, we've built what we call a resilient and regenerative guide. Uh, yes, you can have my water. There's my coworker who's four. Um, capital screens and soon to come impact measure frameworks and toolkit. And the toolkit is really being aimed at supporting the resilience 101 efforts of Native nations, developers, lenders, and communities. And Stuart's been integral in that work, as have other thought partners in our Resilience 21 family. And so I'm going to shut the door. Can you go shut the door? Home life. It's Yep, that's what it is. And we have access right at NDN, um, really in policy spaces to reimagine and, and shape what our systems can do to be more responsive, inclusive, resilient, feature-minded, and innovative. Um, and this is in federal bureaucracy, social and impact, um, investing in spaces, Bijan, Miigwech, um, in philanthropy and academia, global initiatives, because as many of you on this call know there are millions of indigenous people across the globe and I think we represent lands that are covering about 80 percent of the world's biodiversity and I could ramble on more about Indian and we do at Indian love to talk policy priorities um, in deets at any time but I want to pause and give you a sample right of what this collective work can do by just quickly showcasing a couple projects in our waterway so Lori, feel free to uh, show, um, I'm not a, in graphic design, so you can probably see it. It'll look a little rough, but we'll start with the pictures. Um, and the pictures represent one project, let's see, um, on the top right, yeah. And so it's kind of a compressed photo, but it's a photo of styrofoam that would normally end up in a landfill. And on the bottom is construction with a building block that is earth friendly and has the potential to upcycle almost all of the styrofoam in the state of Minnesota, because um, this uh, green manufacturing facility would be based here in the Twin Cities. And that block meets the needs of a largely untapped market for sustainable construction alternatives, and it's also certified um, to natural disasters. So this project is scalable, it can be used in all types of residential and commercial construction, and it's also owned, uh, Native women owned, so it's pretty exciting, um, and I'll cue you, Lori, when I would like you to play the video, which is a, just a short clip, but I'll quickly say that um, that video is a short recording from an iPhone um, of what's to be the world's largest native-owned buffalo range, and it will be home to over 1,500 buffalo, and this project has multiple bottom-line initiatives that will create socioeconomic opportunity for the Lakota peoples by creating a more localized food system, providing jobs through new industries, and reinvesting opportunities into other social enterprise ventures. Um, and this project will also initiate environmental regeneration and resilience of the indigenous prairie ecosystem and combat climate change by increasing the sequestration of carbon and reducing atmospheric greenhouse gases. So, um, with that, I'll say, need I say more? Chi miigwech, Thanks for listening to me. And Lori, um, if you could please play the clip, that would be amazing. And that's my time, y'all.
and maybe for the sake of time, if it's not working easily, we can move on. Um, but it is, it is powerful to hear like the hoof beats. You can feel it when you're watching the video clip. Um, so maybe that can get shared out later, but it is, it is very inspiring. So um, appreciate the time again. Uh, Chimiguich Bizendelli. Thanks, Nikki. Um, is that that that's the one you sent over? So we can we can share it. Uh, we'll 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 send it out to everybody um, and uh, and post post it up. Um, we can't have one hundred percent. Sorry, kid, interrupt us. My end. As as we all know, as we all know, I thought I was going to have a dog meltdown right when when Nikki was, was presenting too. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna uh, move on, we'll post the video. And um, I'm gonna turn it over to Ron Harris, Chief Resilience Officer from Minneapolis, a place that's been in our, our hearts and minds and souls uh, this, this last year, and especially in the last couple of weeks. So uh, Ron, over to you. All right, well, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Ron Harris. I'm the Chief Resilience Officer for the City of Minneapolis. Um, excuse these tired eyes. We've had a long couple of weeks over here in my city and my state, but uh, grateful for the support that I've received from a whole bunch of people on this call and uh, appreciate you for having me this evening. Um, I'm actually not going to speak because everybody covered everything already, so um, just kidding. Um, looking forward to chatting with you guys. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what R21 means for me um, and why I'm excited to be a part of it. And then I'll just share a little bit about, um, you know, how we're approaching resilience building in Minneapolis. So, uh, you know, one of the reasons why I'm proud and excited to be a part of the leadership team at R21 has largely been shaped by my experience as a chief resilience officer. Um, when I was first appointed to take on this role in Minneapolis, it was clear that our definition of resilience was a little bit too slim to meet the most pressing challenges that my city, Minneapolis, uh, is facing. Um, but, you know, don't get me wrong, climate change is obviously a huge deal and we all need to continue to be driving mitigation and adaptation strategies at all levels of government and in all sectors. Um, but in Minneapolis, our most urgent needs really centered around race and inequity. And in my first resilience strategy, the draft strategy, we identified civil unrest due to police involved shootings actually as a major, major shock that required a significant amount of attention and resources to address whenever that shock occurred. Um, we actually named that back in 2018 as, as a significant resilience challenge. Um, because we rooted our resilience strategy in racial equity, it also served to expand resilience to be far more holistic. Um, the people that suffers the most from police-involved shootings and police violence tend to be the same folks who suffer from inadequate housing and in inequitable access to transit and are more likely to be in neighborhoods where they're breathing bad air. Um, they're also more likely to be essential workers who are earning minimum wage and don't actually have protections on the job or um, health care, things like that. And so we really need to broaden that perspective of resilience. And I think that R21 exists to really advocate for this broader perspective of resilience. Um, I think our efforts to build climate resilience are frankly worthless if that resilience is, isn't anchored in equity. Um, people can't conceptualize future climate impacts if they're distracted by current impacts of systemic racism. And if people feel less valued than property, there's no way that we can ever build trust, certainly from a local government perspective. Um, another important facet is, is having an ability to shape stimulus conversations and infrastructure investments. Uh, we know that cities are set to receive, you know, collectively $2 trillion here in a couple of weeks. What if we decided, right, that our number one goal for the rescue plan was to ensure that our city staff, our residents, our businesses, our community leaders feel more prepared for the next crisis than they do the current one? Um, even more powerfully than that, what if we were successful in helping the Biden administration craft future rescue plans and future infrastructure plans that were actually grounded in the principles of resilience? And I think the benefits are plenty. I think that we'd have a greater focus on impact and a greater ability to start to close racial equity gaps. Um, I think we'd have more integrated and robust planning, recognizing that all these challenges experienced by people are also intersectional. Um, I think that we'd identify multiple opportunities to expand uh, the resilience dividend, right? How do we identify and prioritize the solutions with the most amount of co-benefits? Um, we could also take advantage of crises to not only bounce back, but bounce back forward. Um, the administration already took our slogan to build back better. They might as well work with us to, to do so. <laughs> um, 
but I, you know, I also feel that our voice is so much stronger in the collective and this collective of, of practitioners in R21 really helps to serve uh, or serves to help amplify that collective voice. Um, you know, as, as you all are aware by now, Derek Chauvin was convicted on all charges for the murder of George Floyd, but his murder and the subsequent aftermath really challenged our resilience and continues to challenge us today in Minneapolis. Um, so much of the energy though was focused on the civil unrest, but not enough of it was focused on how community came together during one of the most painful um, and traumatic moments in our city's history. Um, businesses opened up their doors and they fed hungry neighbors and demonstrators for free. Community members were organizing ambulatory services when 911 couldn't respond um, because they were spread, spread so thin across the city. Um, people raised money on Venmo and Cash App and all these unique ways to collect funds and use that money to organize ride share so people didn't miss work or um, pharmacy drop-offs to make sure that the elderly neighbors had access to their, to their medicines. Um, we saw all kinds of partnerships kind of organically emerge to meet all kinds of different needs. Like, what if we actually resourced those efforts during times of non-emergency? Like, what if we started with the folks who stepped up and did that without being asked or not having a template or even having any resources? And we prioritize those people as we're shaping our role to recovery. Um, certainly, I think that if we were to shift to something like that, we'd actually be you know, resourcing in the adaptive com capacity of community so that when these things happened, we're not scrambling to figure out how do we meet these needs. We just press a button and set it in motion because we have been investing in those things over time. Uh, and this is what we're trying to do in Minneapolis. Um, we're asking big questions like how can we end up better as a city uh, as a result of our challenges? How can we set our trajectory on a better path than it was pre-crisis? Uh, how can we ensure that we never go back to the old world because it's abundantly clear by now that the old world was not working for us. Um, and I think that we start by learning a handful of lessons. I think that, you know, never again can we ignore the most vulnerable and marginalized among us. Um, not only can we never ignore them, we have to center them in everything that we do. Um, we can't be siloed in our thinking because people aren't siloed in their lives. Uh, we can no longer ignore hard to measure qualities in our cities like social cohesion and trust in government and things like that because we know that we have to invest in that bank, so to speak, because in hard times like this, we're gonna have to make significant withdrawals. Um, I think that our actions must always answer the questions for who, how much, by when. If we're not intentional about our approaches, then we're intentionally leaving people out. I think that we must continue to leverage cities as the unique laboratories of innovation that they are that we must activate and convene sectors that have been left out or have opted out of being a part of this solution. Um, and if we're ever gonna build an equitable future, we must first reconcile with our past racial injustices as a country that are still plaguing us today. Um, our attempts to sweep it under the rug or to ignore it or to pretend that local government doesn't have a role or to pretend that the private sector doesn't have a role is, is hurting all of us. And we need to get people off the sidelines and be honest about not only our past you know, 400 years of racial injustice, but even over the course of the last 18 months, how we've lived that out in some of our policies or our practices or our, our, our approaches. Um, I think that we as advocates in cities and in partnership with other people have an opening though. I think that we have an opportunity to advance principles that um, actually improve people's lives and actually prepare us for the future. Um, I think we have an opportunity to finally reconcile again with our, with our nation's greatest sins and we can leverage this opportunity to position ourselves to really save this planet. Um, and, you know, last thing I'll say is that I'm just really grateful to be in partnership with all of you all as we work to um, advance the mission of building a just and equitable and resilient future. And um, side note, if you're interested in diving deeper on how many of the CROs in this network and other resilience practitioners are coming together to center racial equity, um, check out our, our racial equity through resilience community of practice, which I can link in the chat. And um, yeah, I'm just grateful that that we're together to having this conversation that we're interested in expanding and broadening this de the definition of resilience because our unique roles and perspectives in this moment serve to um, really beef up the solutions that are put on the table. You know, I think that we're, we're taught and we're trained to see the intersections and we're taught and we're trained to identify the silos and we're taught and we're trained to break those things down so that, um, again, we can expand that resilience dividend and identify multiple co-benefits. Um, I had a conversation with somebody in the healthcare industry and 
I was really inspired because she's like, you know, we really want to, we're inspired by your, your vision for resilience in Minneapolis. And we really want to introduce some of those things in the healthcare industry. And one of the ways that we, we want to do that is to show that there are ways that we can make significant advances during a crisis. And the example that she gave me was for years, the healthcare industry was saying that it's going to take a decade for them to transition to telehealth, telemedicine. And as soon as COVID hit, they figured that out in like eight weeks, right? What are those other opportunities that we can identify that because of the urgency of the crisis that we can now advance uh, policies and solutions much faster and with a greater with greater momentum than we were pre-crisis? I think about broadband access and the fact that we're finally talking about broadband as infrastructure. Um, we're all sitting in front of our laptops or webcams or what have you, and we would not be able to engage in this conversation if we all didn't have some access to internet. How many people are blocked out of not only learning from conversations like this, but contributing their experience as well, simply because they don't have an access point, right? These are things that I think we can identify and leverage the crisis in this moment to propel us forward in a significant way. And I think that resilience gives us the uh, principles and the template and the space, frankly, to have that conversation. Um, and with that, I will, I will leave you to it. I know that I'm speaker number nine or 10 and y'all are getting tired, but again, thanks so much for your time. Thanks so much for your uh, thoughts and prayers for my city and my state. Um, and I'm looking forward to working with you all to to build this future. Thanks, Ron. As as always, um, so inspiring. And uh, thanks for taking the time tonight, especially with with all that you have going on. Um, and uh, I hope you can stay a little bit, and everybody can stay as we we round it out now uh, with Brad Dean from uh, FEMA and the Resilient Nation Partnerships Network, um, who has an announcement. Something came out this week. Uh, re, um, important to, to, to the work that we're doing and, and coming off of what, what Ron just said. Um, and obviously we are uh, nearing our, our ending time um, and are just finishing up with our speakers. So uh, for those who want to stay, we're going to stay. Uh, we will stay on and, and have a conversation with you all. So um, if you can stay, especially on the West Coast, um, please, please stay with us um, as we continue the conversation. So uh, Brad, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Stuart. Thanks, Ron. I think um, my comments are really going to align with a lot of the things that, that really have already been said. Um, and I'll just say from a personal note, it's a, it's pretty humbling to be invited to speak tonight. Uh, it's fun and a big resilience nerd thing to be a little starstruck right now for me. Um, I'm fortunate now to collaborate with many of you, but I think a lot of the people that are here have, have really influenced my career and I, I, I love working with you now. So I'm, I'm just going to start, I'm going to try to be really quick, but I'm going to start with something I think many of us knew, but has really become something significantly more apparent, especially over the last year. And that's resilience really doesn't have a sector, um, that every organization and individual has a stake in creating a more equitable and resilient nation, and, and none of us can do it alone. And the way we approached that was in 2015, uh, we created the Resilient Nation Partnership Network. And um, some of you have been there for like the entire journey. So what started is a hand, just a handful of like-minded individual, uh, individuals now has representation from nearly 600 organizations. And we're always welcoming new voices to join the conversation. I hope many of you uh, will reach out. And we work by placing the success of our partners first and foremost. And, and that's a little bit, sometimes it seems a little bit interesting to work that way, but our partner success is critical because the, your resilience efforts inherently advance FEMA's mission of helping people before, during, and after disasters. Um, and so with that, I'm going to dive into um, our Building the Alliances for Equitable Resilience resource. So this is the network's first co-created resource. Uh, we had, um, and Lori, I don't know if we can drop it in there. Um, thanks for dropping that in the chat. It's in the chat, yeah. Great. Um, and um, we had two minutes to pull it up. Oh, um, it's up to you. I, I think everyone can access it in the chat. So um, for this, we had 26 external contributors. Um, it's absolutely no surprise that many of them are Resilience 21 members like Lori and Dr. Martin and Anna Morandi, Ryan Coker. I mean, even, even more... Resilience 20 member, uh, 21 members and many of you on this call are active partners in the network. And so um, if you joined us uh, in October, I'm gonna use a quote, I'm gonna, I'm gonna steal something from, 
from Dr. Martin here. I'm gonna use a quote from Dion Ferris, who's the president of the Institute for Sustainable Communities uh, as a guide. And she opened our alliances for equity forum in October and her words were so impactful that we, we use them to open this resource. And so she said, be brave, be an investor in relationship building and listening, be clear in your purpose to collaborate and partner, be respectful of diverse leadership and differing views. Be open to learning from other people's lived experiences. Be honest, listen, and be willing to make meaningful adjustments as you learn. And so I'm really quickly going to break it down. So be brave, right? I think this is something we've all experienced over the last year and a half. Um, just so many things going on. So the journey to get where we are with the resource was really tough. Um, we approached Noah about co-hosting the RNP Forum two years ago. And uh, June of 2019, we settled on equity in November of 2019 because climate and natural hazards disproportionately impact underserved and historically marginalized populations. Um, we reached out to Dr. Martin to be our keynote and Lori as a panelist and many of you on this call in January of 2020. It feels like it was not that long ago, but we scheduled for March, postponed, pivoted virtually everything we've all done, this is the definition of resilience. And, it's, and, over, and over that time, we never could have imagined um, how the world was going to change, how equity was gonna be at the forefront of every conversation, how we had to adapt to the pandemic and figure out how to make human connections virtually. And like Dr. Martin said earlier, doing the right thing takes being brave and a whole lot of hard work. And, so being an investor in relationship building and, re and listening, um, FEMA and the, and the Resilient Nation Partnership Network positioned ourselves as a convener. We invested the time in the background to elevate the voices of thought leaders and, and the respected change agents that deliver the messages widely that we needed on equity. We actively engaged organizations, many of whom have literally never interacted with FEMA or may not have thought resilience aligned with their mission space. And they took away something very different from that conversation. Uh, she said, be clear in your purpose to collaborate and partner. Our purpose was clear. and We wanted to co-create a resource that inspires the whole community to make equitable and resilient practices part of their day-to-day. -day. Um, be respectful of diverse leadership and differing views. Our partners' expertise, leadership, and perspectives helped establish a resource that all organizations can use to advance equitable resilience. No, um, I heard you. To I learning heard from others' lived experiences. Um, we incorporated individual stories to make connections on a more personal level, sharing how lived experiences influenced resilience actions and provided purpose for our colleagues. And finally, she said, be honest, listen, and be willing to make meaningful adjustments as you learn. And this is what I hope we all come away with today and take away from the resource that many of us put a lot of time and effort into is that um, we created a foundational resource for the resilience community and for many others. And it's now on us to use the knowledge to be honest, to listen, and to make meaningful adjustments as we move forward advancing equitable resilience initiatives. And the last thing I'll say is the credit for this resource goes to all of our partners. Um, it is their belief in what we at the Resilient Asian Partnership Network do uh, and we're trying to accomplish that keeps our team motivated and moving forward. And uh, we thank you all so very much. So Stuart, back to you. Great. Thanks a lot, Brad. Um, and hopefully everybody has been able to click on the link and, and can download that and check out the guide. Um, as Brad said, um, incredible number of people in this group and beyond uh, create, helped create that. And um, it's, a, it's a great resource. So um, we've reached the end of our speakers. And, um, and like COVID, that's just kind of seems like it went on for a while. Um, and, and, but we had to get there and we had to get through all of that. And I just, I myself am sitting here just kind of uh, gobsmacked at the, at, at the speakers and what they had to say and how it tied together. Um, and even though I know um, most of them, um, again, just incredibly uh, inspired and impressed. So we are gonna open up to questions um, and have a discussion. There's still a hundred people on the call um, and I'm happy to keep this conversation going. Um, and uh, uh, 
Lori, I don't know if you saw any groupings from the chat um, while it was going on, um, but I'm also happy to have people just raise their hands, um, um, uh, literally, figuratively, virtually, um, and um, we'll call on you and uh, have you ask your question. I don't see any hands up, so if somebody wants there to... Is a, there is a question to Greg. Sorry, I'm doing multiple things at once. That's the that's what we do in the resilient, resiliency world. Um, a question for Greg around um, how are you specifically dealing with the, um, the inter intersection between housing and infrastructure in your mitigation planning? In terms of actions, are you... Are you, are you um, yeah, no, no, that's a, that's a good, that's a very interesting one. Housing in the VI is very interesting because um, mostly of the water, the water system, uh, uh, most of the population is not connected to a, a central uh, government operated water system, um, mostly because of uh, challenges associated with our geology and our topography. Uh, it's, it's very expensive to dig through um, rock and uh, very mountainous terrain. So most people uh, depend on cisterns uh, for their water. And um, most people then become their own sort of water management, uh, either through cisterns or wells. Uh, the Just 75% of the population depends on, on cistern. Uh, even those who are connected to the uh, public water system uh, decide and, and, and build cistern. Uh, because water harvesting or, or rainwater catchment is is so such a, a cultural ingrained practice, and so that means that this interconnection between power and water um, becomes very critical for folks because you need to have a pump. Um, but also, people become very uh, attuned to to the climate sort of uh, uh, sort of variation uh, uh, in the territory. And also to the to this interconnection with and the need for other systems. So that that's one thing. The other thing is that from the, the hazard mitigation plan, what we are looking at, because we are spending so much time thinking about service delivery, we are thinking not only about the service provider, but about how can people access power, how can people access water, how can people access the various services that they need. And through that, there are interconnections between. Um, you know, water and transportation, for example, uh, water and uh, power, like I mentioned earlier, uh, but also telecommunication and power, et cetera, et cetera. So we're looking at all of those interconnections at a household level and asking the question, how can people have access to those services? And that leads to not only thinking about the service provider, but also promoting uh, a, a mitigation strategy at a household level. And we've had discussion with Tima about whether or not the BRIC program can be used to help subsidize or fund uh, uh, you know, more solar at household level or more solution at household level. And uh, the answers are not clear yet, but we're definitely gonna try to push uh, uh, for more of those um, sort of uh, strategies at a household level uh, for people to have access to what they need and to also satisfy the need for some of those interdependencies, such as you know, more solar-powered pumps or, or or things like that. So um, so yeah, it's a it's a very interesting process to not only understand the thinking at the federal level and at FEMA, which I think um, needs to you know, there's some discussion there, but also you know what we can do to really sort of increase more increase people's ability to even know better uh, uh, how to operate their system and in the process, uh, increase their resilience. Thank you, Greg. There's a question coming in. Um, iPad, that's not your name, but that's the... <laughs> Could you tell us your name? Oh, un unmute. Let me unmute you. Hold on. I'm going to unmute you. Okay, there you go. Let's unmute you again. Could you unmute your... Wait, 
We're almost going to get it. Hold on. Uh, you have to unmute your, hold on. Do you want to write it in the chat? We're having unmuting. Okay, here we go. Let's, we're trying to unmute. Let's see. I couldn't get it to, to hers to unmute either. There must, there's like no. a lock on it or something. If she could type it in, it'd be great. Um, it, it might be just that she has, she has an older version of Zoom. And sometimes that won't allow you to unmute the participant. Yeah, that's what it looks like. Can you write it in the chat? Okay. I think our friend from St. John is not. Darn, okay. Uh, next, any anybody else have question? I think the question coming in, Stuart, is what now? Where do we go from here? What is our 21's plans? Um, we can all take that, but there's definitely um, been a plan. And as Samantha and others know, um, and I'll just say a couple words and, and turn it over to others, um, because they're, the great thing about R21 so far has been um, a large group came together, um, had a, a, a incredible number of recommendations that we distilled down into the document that you see online and that was um, taken to the, to the transition team, um, posted online, and we've gone to work since then. And I think really, um, and, and we had a number of people touch on this, um, as we've gone to talk to the administration, which is part of what R21 has continued to do individually or as this group. We've also gone to the White House and to the, to the, the committees who are putting together and marking up the plans to start to be very specific about a lot of what the speakers talked about, which is this regulation or connecting HUD to FEMA to EPA to, to the Department of Transportation and linking together each of the pieces. Um, each of the three of us and everyone else that you heard that's on the, the leadership circle, as well as um, individual members um, are doing that kind of outreach. So um, that's part of the plan going forward is that specific outreach on federal policy. Um, but we've also been working on materials, PowerPoints and other types of activities um, and, and doing panels. Uh, <laughs> a number of us have Earth Day panels tomorrow, um, and some of you have been doing them all week. Um, but I'll, I'll turn it over to others, um, including Marissa and, um, sure. and Lori, Lori to jump in there, but also members of the, the leadership circle, because there's a lot happening that we're moving forward with. So I'll, I'll also add really quickly that, um, you know, this week uh, is very busy and to see so many of you uh, on the screen with some recommendations about additional conversations that we could be having in the future. I think we, we definitely want to figure out the best way to do that moving forward. And so we've had a, a few smaller convenings over the last few months, but seems like there's appetite for more discussions. And so this is a, a place where we can do that. And uh, perhaps some of you on the line have your own stories to tell. Uh, please let us know um, so that we can showcase the great work that's being done. I think so much work is being done. Um, and we don't always, as practitioners, we don't always take a minute to tell our stories. Um, about the successes that we have had. And if this can be a space for us to do that uh, as a family, um, then, then we want to take advantage of that opportunity. And I just want to add, I mean, one of the things that I find valuable about our community, our 21 community, is we're practitioners. You know, we, we are on the ground working day in and day out to get things done. And it's, you know, we see things that um, other sectors don't see. And um, we want to make sure that when the funding comes out, when policies are made, that they're practical and realistic and that they're informed by real people and real, real realities. And it's not just coming out of a textbook. Um, that's, there's a big difference. And, um, you know, that's, we all work together 
you know, we've, we've all worked together for, for years. And so this is why we're, we're excited about, you know, plussing up this work and amplifying it and getting it, the message across to the right people. We finally have that time. Um, yeah. Just highlighting some Lauren, of our leadership Lauren, members wanna, here. Yeah, Atiyah or Lorian, you wanna tackle that question? Only because you're making me, Stuart. Yeah, Lauren, no, Lauren's giving me the look too, like, great, go ahead, pick on me. <laughs> Stuart, um, I, was, I was multitasking, so I, I <laughs> thank you, Atiyah. No problem, I got you covered. Take one for the team. Um, so I think one of the um, big pieces really is amplifying. Um, so there, there's the policy recommendations and there's all of the um, work that has been progressing in that area. And then there's also helping people um, to get connected back to um, really understanding some of the principles behind um, how we put together Resilient 21, because it's not only about the policies, it's about the thinking that went into it, the framing, the considerations um, um, about all of the different um, kind of silos we were talking about before and bringing them together. And so I think in addition to it being um, about policy shift, it's also about reframing um, and giving people different and new language. And so the more that we can amplify the message, the more that we can share with people, um, I think the more that we can also influence the broader resilience community and field and beyond, right? Because we're kind of the, the choir here. And we know that there are lots of other folks who are kind of under the umbrella of the field influence what we're doing um, and making sure that we're connecting those dots. So um, I will stop there and uh, see if Laurian, now that she's um, no longer multitasking, has anything to add. <laughs> I'm, I'm very attentive now, <laughs> but could you, could you repeat the question for me, please? Because I don't want to guess at it. No, I was just saying because um, the, the question, the big question was, what's next, what's now, how do we move forward? And we were all just kind of opining. Um, and I picked a, a moment when I knew you were looking at your cell phone, so. Um, I know, you know me very well. Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm always blown away by the, these conversations and the people on the call and the, the depth of knowledge. I, and then it's easy to forget that resilience is still a new field, um, relatively new and, when people talk about resilience, they're not often talking about it the way that we are. And so for me, one of the priorities is really um, making sure that we can get some standard agreement language around what is holistic resilience, uh, true resilience and not resilience in pieces uh, or performative resilience, right? Um, and so I think what's next, it has to be a lot, we have to really think about our, our campaign for education, because um, everybody's coming to the table. Once you say resilience, yes, I want in. It's not the problem, but it's how do we how do we make sure that we're all marching forward in the same with the same drumbeat in the same direction? And and when we act together, we will be able to do so much more than we're all running off in different directions. So I think that that's the next thing that I have top of my mind. Um, thanks, Lorian. And, and um, in terms of a deeper dive, you know, looking at the chat um, and knowing who's on here, um, Michael Friedberg just threw something in there about mortgage risk. Um, and that relates to something way back on the chat that I stuck in that uh, Lori and Nikki have both been involved in, which is a resilient community development finance tool and guide that's really about resilient lending of all types. And it relates to what Nikki was saying about the kind of loans that they're trying to make and the, the screen that they're using. So um, the finance treasury CDFI side is sort of one, is, is one deep dive and we have to keep pushing there um, around banking and lending and insurance and mortgage um, to, to Michael's point in question. And then um, uh, we talked about just diving down on resilient housing and what that means and what that means for affordable housing and some of the guides that have been, been, been created. So that's another thing too, is that as this group grows, we have asked, would someone like to take off and work on X subject as a subcommittee and drive down that lane and go talk to that committee and go talk to those people? Um, there's a former HUD colleague of ours who's a special assistant to the president on housing at the White House now 
we should probably spend some time talking to her. Um, but we should also talk to the grassroots level folks that we're all already trying to pull into this. Um, and we call it the continuum, sort of from the project and community level all the way to the government and national level and everything in between. So that's part of it is for us is like, what do you want it to be? And how do we, how do we all, all drive towards that on those individual themes too? I'll add, there's a lot of funding coming out. I mean, Marion said this earlier, we've got a real opportunity to see this funding being used in a real way. And it's been slower than we'd like uh, in, many, in many respects. We need to make some of these programs permanent. As Marion said, the CDBGDR program, other programs we have built knowledge and money can go out faster to our community, to our communities. That's round two. Um, well, I just want to thank thank everyone. We we're just really thrilled at what we what 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 has been inspired tonight. In advance of tomorrow's events, we're going to hear a lot from the administration, and uh, we'll be in contact with one another. Um, Stuart Barissa, should we adjourn for the evening? Yeah, we've kept everybody almost in an extra half an hour. I can't believe we still have 75 uh, people on, um, but, but really, really appreciate all of you that have, have, have joined and and a, and a huge thanks to our speakers. I know not all, all of them are still on with us. I know Amy had to, had to jump off, but um, thank you to all the speakers. Thank you to those that have um, joined us in the resilience um, uh, uh, I was going to call it something that Marissa told me I shouldn't, which is the uh, resilience elders circle. But um, the uh, leadership circle that's helping us and and uh, see, I got laughs off the joke after what the fifteenth time. Marissa's like, "Don't do it, Stuart." I've just heard it too many times. <laughs> Kidding. But we do, we do really, really want to thank the speakers and those that have joined us on, on and the leadership and, and been able to do this. Um, Samantha, thank you for joining us um, and leading off today and really uh, fighting the good fight for, for some time now, um, but also now as the, the legislation is moving, uh, bringing the people together that, that we need to to uh, take it to the next level. So um, that's all for me. Leave it to my co-facilitators if they want to throw in a last last word. Um, Th thank you to everyone. Rest up. Many of us have a very busy day tomorrow. Thank you all. The recording will be available. We love you all. Thank you for coming together. And Thanks and have a good night. We'll see you soon. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hey, Larry.